You're listening to Megiddo Radio. Megiddo Radio is a radio ministry of Megiddo Media. For more, visit our website at megiddoradio.com. That's megiddoradio.com. Good everybody, welcome. This is Paul Flynn with Megiddo Radio for the 8th of July, 2017. Thank you all for tuning in. Tonight's program, we're going to be talking about a lot of things. And in all honesty, I hope it can be covered tonight, but it will probably need Monday's show. Look, I, I'm i not aware, I can't really remember, but I think I, I said the first time I was talking about the James White Yasser Khadi controversy. And if, if you're new to all this, I would recommend that you go back to two, show number 263, go to megitaradio.com. Uh, it's also on YouTube, but it's probably easier to find than megitaradio.com. And on that, my plan was to do, I think it was like two or three shows, but unfortunately, more and more material has come to light. I'm willing to cover this as long as there's something new to talk about. And uh, I hope, by the grace of God, to be able to go through James White's version of... Second John uh, verses 9 to 11. But what I really want to cover in this program as much as possible, there's a lot of different things, especially there's been some new, new news in the last uh, few days, and I'm going to cover that first. But later, I kind of want to... I'm going to see how the show goes. It's, there's a lot to cover. I don't want to rush through anything. Bill Johnson of Grace to You, the executive director of Grace to You, was on... I think people, anybody who's been following the kind of James White Yasser controversy, as I call it, has been aware that Phil Johnson on his Facebook page, basically the, the comment he put up was, is there any respectable Christian leader that Brandon House hasn't, and he put hasn't in capital letters, criticized? Now, I, look, I'll be honest, I, I don't think I've listened to I did, I'd probably, I hadn't listened to much Christian radio for a very long time, so, but at the same time, I knew enough about Brian House that he, he hasn't gone after everybody, he likes John MacArthur, still think he likes him to a certain degree, Um, might be certain things going on there that he might not be too happy with, like, I don't want to speak for him or anything like that, but the only people I can think that and look, and I don't want to be here on just kind of defending Brian House. This, this is not about him. It's kind of silly that that was, the, that was a really irresponsible Facebook post. It just, it just is. Um, if you wanted to critique, if Phil Johnson wanted to critique Brandon House all for it, you know, write an article, detail exactly what are you talking about? Because the same accusation could be made against Phil Johnson. Some people like Michael Brown. And and I am not a I am not opposed to the criticism that Phil Johnson put towards Michael Brown. Actually, I I can't think of much that I might have disagreed with. And I would be quibbling if I if I did. So it was a complete shock to me when he I don't want to put it... Again, this is not a James White, Brandon House issue, but he sided against Brandon House and sided with James White. Again, we got to get past this. You see, a lot of, a lot of time... Here, here's what happens. People who are not really paying attention to... Haven't, you know, maybe haven't listened to the dialogue or whatever, for whatever reason, have made this out to be that. Brandon House has made the issue go... Become well-known, but prior to that, it was known probably, I don't know, in small circles. And didn't seem to be that big of an event. And people didn't really think of it being that different. Or just really didn't get that much coverage, really, which is kind of scary, to be honest. Now, the way to do it is not just to put up a silly... Facebook, I don't know what else he's put up or anything like that, but there's a play, there's a way to do critiques of your brothers in Christ. Okay, so 
I mean, I'm going to have to go. Phil Johnson was on Chris Aronson's program, Iron Sharpens Iron Radio. That's what the main focus of my program is going to be today. Now, I'm going to look at that after. I'm going to look at some of the comments. Uh, I'm going to give a proper introduction in a second uh, of my view of both of these men before and now. Uh, but first of all, before I get into that, what's her name again? Linda Sarsour. Trying to make sure I don't pronounce it wrong. She's a kind of a darling of the left. She is a Muslim. She is pushing for Sharia in the United States. She is... I can see why the left loves her, because she loves the, the victim, victimhood status that has been pushed by the left, by any minority whatsoever. Look, I'm sure there, are, there is discrimination against certain minorities around the world, but the United States? Really? Is the United States perfect? No. But the United States is one place if you work hard. I'm not from the United States, by the way. I'm from Ireland. It's one place you work hard, you will succeed. You might have doors shut in your face, all that kind of stuff. It's not like, okay, you might have no money, but there's ways of getting jobs, opportunities, more than any other nation on earth, probably. So, it's kind of ridiculous. But anyway, let's. she was speaking a few days ago. This is Linda Sarsour. And she said, quote, we need to be perpetually outraged that the Muslims in the United States. That's really going to help things, especially with the current atmosphere. Her, her comments are completely irresponsible. I'm going to play them now in a second from her talk at the Islamic Society of North America. And this is over the uh, July 4th weekend. The, society, the Islamic Society of North America are linked to Hamas. and. Look, this shouldn't surprise anybody. There always seems to be, with all these Muslim groups, a link, some kind of a link. You know, they might have somebody speaking for them, or they praise somebody who is a terrorist and all this kind of stuff. Unfortunately, this is also known on the left. Similar things, Jeremy Corbyn in England, in the United, in the United Kingdom, he, back in the 80s, was very pro-militant IRA sympathies towards them didn't see, I think it was back in 2009, he didn't see the Hamas as a terrorist organization. I have to check that again. But he has links, and Gatestone Institute and other journalists have dealt with Jeremy Corbyn, and probably one of the best places to go would probably go to Gatestone Institute if you want to research this further and type in the word Jeremy Corbyn. And unfortunately, the What's basically far left is on the rise in the United Kingdom. And very much leaning towards high tax, kind of stuff that Bernie Sanders would have been advocating in the United States, is in advocating in the United States. And his sympathies towards kind of Central American, South American dictatorships and their food lines. There's videos about that from his really, really disgusting views. But anyway, let's play some of the clips. This is some of the clips from, if you want to watch the whole thing, it's on YouTube somewhere. Um, but anyway, so I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to comment on it afterwards. The reason why this is important to the James White Yasser Qadi controversy is this. Yasser Qadi was at the talk. Yasser Qadi thinks very highly of Linda Sarsour. And I'm going to read some of his comments about Linda Sarsour. They've been pictured together on Instagram on Linda Sarsour's account. Also, uh, Yasser Qadi has publicly uh, lauded this woman. Here's what she says. Sisters and brothers, it's been 16, almost 17 years since the horrific attacks of 9-11. And we still, as a community, find ourselves unprepared 
in so many moments. Why, sisters and brothers, why are we so unprepared? Why are we so afraid of this administration and the potential chaos that they will ensue on our community? And we already saw their potential when they come out every few weeks, Muslim ban one, Muslim ban two, Muslim ban three. They are relentless, they are persistent and consistent and wanna see how much we as a community can endure and wanna see who our friends are and how hard we're going to fight back against this administration. And I hope it goes on to the next clip now in a second, and you see this a lot. She's very much, she's very aggressive. She's a very extremely aggressive version, for the United States at least. But, I mean, what do you say to that? The Muslim ban, well, it's not even a Muslim ban, it was a ban from immigration, a temporary ban for three months, by the way, for seven nations that were primarily Muslim, that were terrorist hotspots. If you want to say, and here's the thing, right? If the place where there are terrorist hotspots happens to block primarily Muslim nations from entering the United States, maybe the problem isn't the United States. Maybe it's Islam. Just Maybe. That we, when we stand up to those who oppress our communities, that Allah accepts from us that as a form of jihad. Even just before I get into the jihad comments that, you know, the oppression from... Look, in the Quran, oppression is anybody who gets in their way. You stand in the way of the, the complete dominance of Islam... You're oppressing them, you're oppressing... That, that's the impression I get when I read through the Quran. Do not trust them. Do not take the Jews and the Christians for friends. They are friends of each other, the Quran says. So there's a perpetual... In, that, in the Quran, there's a distrust of outsiders. They're seeing them as filthy. Now, I know people try to normalize and say, oh, well, the Bible says, uh, for all of sin to fall short of the glory of God, we're, we're all a filthy thing, all these kind of things. Um, our greatest deeds are with filthy rags. That's completely different. And the Bible says that all have sinned. Every single one of us are wretched. Every single one of us. But the Quran is different. The Quran says that Muslims are the greatest of creatures. And all others are pigs and dogs. Now, does every Muslim believe this? No. Okay, I'm just going to go back a little bit to her this is the, these are the comments that caused much of this controversy recently relating to Linda Sarsour. When we stand up to those who oppress our communities, that Allah accepts from us that as a form of jihad, that we are struggling against tyrants and rulers, not only abroad in the Middle East or in the other side of the world, but here in these United States of America where you have fascists and white supremacists and Islamophobes reigning in the White House. How much we as a community can just need to play it one more time because sometimes when you hear this once, it's hard to digest it. Let's listen again. And how hard we're going to fight back against this administration. And I hope that we, when we stand up to those who oppress our communities, that Allah accepts from us that as a form of jihad, that we are struggling against tyrants. and. So uh, who is that? That it, those are those people who stand in the way of the complete domination of Islam. She talks about in her speech being perpetually outraged. She talks, just get some other quotations um, about Muslims. The priority is not to assimilate, and they don't. They create nations within a nation, and they create Sharia courts in other countries. They do not want to follow the laws of the land they, they go into. This is documented time and time again in different countries. Rulers, not only abroad in the Middle East or in the other side of the world, but here in these United States of America where you have fascists and white supremacists and Islamophobes reigning in the White House. And just to translate that word Islamophobe, Islamophobe means anyone, anyone that stands in the way of Islam. And I hate the word... You know, phobia, what, an irrational fear of a religion that wants you dead. I don't think that's incredibly irrational. Now, does every Muslim want you dead? No, of course not. 
I don't believe that. But what does the Quran teach? It's like how many professing Christians in the world actually believe the Bible? Not a whole lot. So just because they're raised in Muslim homes and all this kind of stuff. But if... Scary thing is you want to be... You want to follow the example of Muhammad? A disgusting pedophile? This must be brought up. This man married a six-year-old, Aisha, consummated marriage at nine. Islam allows the taking of sex slaves. And this has been defended by academics in the Middle East, by the way. This is not some fringe view. What ISIS is doing is straight out of the Quran and the Hadith. They are following the example of the Prophet Muhammad. Now, maybe you could argue Linda Sarsour does has a different understanding of what jihad means. I'm sure she's not that stupid. You have no clue, especially if she's like, what? I think she's like Palestinian as well. That she has no clue. At best, it's confusing and irresponsible. At worst, it's criminal. It's inciting violence. Saying, basically calling for jihad against the President of the United States. Oh, it's just speaking a word in, in opposition. That's what she said. Yes, but that word means something in the Islamic context and serving Allah. When the Quran says, those who are slain and are slain. We have to stay outraged. Do not criticize me when I say that we as a Muslim community in these United States of America have to be perpetually outraged every single When I wake up in the morning and I remember who's sitting in the White House, I am... And this is why they get on so well with the left. They're perpetually outraged about everything. Because they believe they're the best of creatures and they deserve the best. Does the Quran not teach this? That Muslims are the best of creatures? I've gone through this in other programs. If people want references, and they can email me, get a films at gmail.com. But people have gone through this. I also noticed that the Yasser Khan, I, I they didn't pan the, the audience or anything like that, but it seems like a large amount of the people who were there at the Yasser Khan, James White dialogue, interfaith dialogue, were not, had not read the Quran, or at least just had read parts of it. So, read it. Read it. The Quran is kind of hard to explain because it lacks context. But the context is very much filled in by the Hadith. But even without the Hadith, Surah 9, and this is something that James White wanted his mentor, Yasser Qadi, he's the man he is a kindred spirit with, he wants him to contextualize it for people. Look, it doesn't matter how much James White speaks out both sides of his mouth. He sees Islam, consistent Islam, as a religion of peace. I know he says that there is no monolithic consistent Islam. I've listened to enough interviews of him saying that. But he's speaking out both sides of his mouth. Okay? He says there is no consistent Islam. But he says that Yasser Qadi is consistent. I've said this before. And when, in another video, this is before the controversy broke out. I think it was, might have been from a couple of years ago. I think it's called More Thoughts in Islam. He says, you know that when they take those verses, you know, that militants and violent people and things like that. He put in the words, if they provide a certain context. So he sees consistent Qadi, and Qadi puts forth the mythical, peaceful Islam. So, with lie after lie after lie in his presentation, unchallenged, before the saints. Now you want to talk, oh, is it a building, all this kind of nonsense. Okay. The church, if you want to say the church is the people of God, the people of God were there. So, anyway, 
So let's go on to let's let's finish off this clip, these clips from Linda Sarsour's talk at the ISNA, which is Hamas is linked to Hamas. Outrage. This is not normal, sisters and brothers. Those people sitting in the most powerful seats in this country is not normal. So do not ever be those citizens that normalize this administration because when the day comes that something horrific happens to us or to another community, you will be responsible for normalizing this administration. How about normalizing the barbarous Islamic killings across the world? You know, they're all for... And some things, bad, bad things do happen to Muslims at times. Of course they do. But compared with the terror attacks around the world, and these have been compiled by the religion of peace.com, and you can just go to terror attacks, and then a little drop-down screen pops up, and it says, in the name of Allah. And if you see the amount of attacks since July began, just to give you an idea, in June of 2017, there's been 164 attacks, 1,176 killed, 1,382 injured, 34 suicide blasts in 30 countries in the name of Allah. Since 9-11, 31,148 attacks, Islamic attacks, carried out in the name of Allah. This is not just a handful. And you can be sure if the quote-unquote Islamic, Islamophobe attacks happen, it'll be all over the media. They don't cover in Kenya today. Nine injured. Nine villagers were beheaded like, like chickens by Islamic extremists. This is in Kenya. Egypt, 23 killed, 33 injured. Yesterday, in Syria on the 6th, which is two days ago, in Hama in Syria, three were killed, nine injured by a suicide bomber. In Saudi Arabia, one was killed and six were injured by a Shiite extremist uh, kills a local cop with an explosive device. On and on and on. Every day around the world, there are terror attacks in the name of Allah. But they, they get to be outraged when, when a country dares say, you know, um, you know those countries where a lot of people are blowing themselves up? Maybe it's a good idea to not let those people in for a while. And let's just see, you know, screen a little bit. No, 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 you're oppressing us. No, no, you're looking for privileged status. That's what you're looking for. Our number one and top priority is to protect and defend our communities. It is not to assimilate and to please any other people. In a not to assimilate. No, 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 no. <laughs> and they haven't been doing that anywhere. Creating nation within a nation and setting up Sharia courts. Authority. Our obligation is to our young people, is to our women, and make sure our, our women are protected in our community. And our... This is disgusting. Considering that Sweden has become the rape capital of the West for the, the Muslim community anywhere to take the moral high ground is just patently disgusting. Do some research in Sweden. What has happened to Sweden with mass immigration? These people. Top priority, even higher than all those pr priorities, is to please Allah and only Allah. Let's look at a quotation here from the Shafi Legal Manual. This is the, Shafi, or the school of the Islamic jurisprudence. Omdat al-Salik, which is Reliance of the Traveler. And Robert Spencer says on this, which has been certified by al-Azhar, the foremost authority in Sunni Islam is conforming to the, quote, practice and faith of the Orthodox Sunni community, unquote denotes one paragraph to jihad as spiritual struggle, yeah, and that's what everybody's going to try and say, well, it's been, people have been trying to say on the left, then it spends, this is Robert Spencer commenting here, then it spends seven pages on jihad as warfare, 
makes it quite clear that jihad is warfare against non-Muslims. This is what the reliance of the traveler states. Jihad means to war against non-Muslims and is etymologically derived from the word mujahada, signifying welfare to establish the religion. Warfare, sorry. Warfare to establish religion. Maybe a bit of a Freudian slip there because... Because Sarsour is part of the DNC, but I digress. And it is the lesser... And it is the lesser jihad. So, you know, the, the violent one is the lesser jihad, but it's still there. As for the greater jihad, it says it is spiritual warfare against the lower self, nafs. Which is why the Prophet, Allah bless him and give him peace, said he... It says, as he's returning from jihad, quote, we have returned from the lesser jihad to the greater jihad. The spiritual basis for jihad prior to scholarly consensus is such Quranic verses as, Fight, fighting is prescribed for you, Surah 2, 216. Slay them wherever you find them, 489. Fight the idolaters utterly, Surah 9, 36. And such of these as one related by Bukhari, a Muslim, that the Prophet Allah said, the Prophet said, anyway, this is talking about um, Muhammad. Bah Bukhari and Muslim are the two collections of hadith, we've said this before, most respected in the Islamic world and generally accepted by all, except for probably Quran-only Muslims, and they're not really that prevalent, really. It says here, I have been commanded to fight until they testify that there is no God but Allah and that M Muhammad is the messenger of Allah and perform the prayer and pay zakat. If they say they have saved their blood possessions from me except for the rights of Islam over them and their final reckoning is with Allah. And hadith reported by Muslim. This is uh, from Sahih Muslim. To go forth in the morning or evening, to fight in the path of Allah is better than the whole world and everything in it. So it's, it's quite clear. Okay, yeah, included in Jihad is the spiritual struggle. But also, there is also reported anywhere you care to look that is any kind of bearing upon the Islamic world. You always have a warfare, Jihad. There's a lesser jihad and a greater jihad. So, they want to point out that part, and it's a half-truth, and half-truths are dangerous. Now, so that's Linda Sarsour. Let's look at some of her connections now to Yasser Qadi. Yasser Qadi was at the same conference with Linda Sarsour. Brandon House has written an article. I haven't had a chance to go through his article, but he's posted a lot of the links and information at worldviewweekend.com. And so he, Yasser Qadi was there. Robert Spencer affirmed that. And also, Brandon, if you go to his Facebook page and other pages, if you go to worldviewweekend.com, he's got an article on there where they have... There's a picture that is on the Twitter account, Change. So, a picture with Yasser Kadi with Linda Sarsour. You might just say, oh, that's a picture. That's from the 30th of June... 2017, that weekend. Little thing that says, hashtag no Muslim ban ever. And are we, quote, quote bon, bona fide, was it bona fide, bona fide, sorry, bona fide, uh, Muslim family. So enough. Okay. So anyway. So who is Linda Sarsour? And a lot of this information, and thanks to Brandon House, who's done a lot of research. Also, if you want more information, it was a really good program that he did with Robert Spencer. Um, I don't get to listen to as much Christian radio anymore, so I don't know what else has been done and things like that. Often I 
when I'm working, I travel two hours to and two hours back. So most of my research, I just need to print it off and grab. The internet is terrible when I'm traveling. So uh, often I don't get to follow up on a lot of this stuff as much as I would like. But anyway, he did a great program. Was it about a week ago with Robert Spencer? Robert Spencer is probably the best scholar in this area that I know of, at least. Now, he's not a Christian. He's a, I think he's a Marianite Catholic or something like that. So pray for, pray for the man's soul. But he's the best scholar in this area that I have found. I was, I'm very cautious to recommend people. And it's, uh, I, I remember I bought his book on, he wrote a book on Muhammad, which is the first one I read, The Truth About, I think it's called The Truth About Muhammad. Anyway, it's a very good book. And he's also got a book on ISIS, well-documented, He's a very balanced man. He tries to document absolutely everything and that he does. And this, um, he's vilified and uh, by Yasser Qadi as well. But Linda Sarsour, let's look into who she is. She's a resident of Brooklyn. She is in an Arab American. She's an Arab American, I identify myself as a Palestinian Muslim American. Executive Director of Arab American Association of New York. Co-founder of the Muslim Democrat Club of New York member of the Justice League NYC. Um, what else is... So, according to the New York Times, Sarsour is deeply involved in Black Lives Matter movement, very, you know, the one that calls for dead cops. There's videos of that, by the way. What do we want? Dead cops. What do we want now? There's a... Lots of violence comes from the Black Lives Matter movement. Anyway, so... Not good connections there and what does Yasser Qadi we have to know who this guy James White is putting forward this guy has been put forward by James White whatever way you want to slice it whatever way you fall on either side defending him or not defending him you have to admit that James White is saying okay you want to know about Islam listen to this guy can we at least admit that and this guy is honest and everything else okay what does I get the quotation in front of me. Oh, yeah, here we go. What did Yasser Qadi, Yasser Qadi in social media, I think this is on Facebook. Yeah. Anyway, he said, he, and this is, goes back to Jan January 23rd of this year. And he said this. This is Yasser Qadi says this. Said this, anyway. Linda Sarsour is an activist of the highest caliber. She's eloquent, brave, and fearless. I am proud to call her an ally and friend. Well, the disgusting and violent attacks by the far right Islamophobes, that would be me, uh, against her only indicate the, f well, not, not just me, Robert Spencer and all the people like that who've done far, who've done um, excellent work in the media looking at this. But anyway, the disgusting and violent attacks by the far right Islamophobes against her her indicate only indicate that the fear that Allah has blessed her to strike <laughs> I have to read this properly the disgusting and vile attacks of the far right Islamophobes against her only indicate the fear that Allah has blessed her to strike in the hearts of such pitiful haters yeah because you know the hadith say, I've been commanded to strike terror to the hearts of the unbelievers or words to that effect anyway, I, I think there's a hadith like that so he vehemently supports, at least a couple of months ago, supported Linda Sarsour. Linda Sarsour now calls for, look, whatever one of you has slice it, calls for jihad against the President of the United States. Maybe the best thing you could say about her, she is ignorant and she's being foolish. And what she's saying is, at the very minimum, dangerous, unintentionally so. That's the minimum you can say. Can't get inside her head. But there's a clear meaning in the Islamic world what this word means. <sighs> anyway. And, the, and these people seem to know each other for quite a while. Going to go, this is on Linda Sarsour's Instagram account, dated... April 10th, 2016, there's a picture of her and three Muslim men, you might recognize one of the guys, 
One is Imam Omar Suleiman, Sheikh Yasser Qadi, and Faris Barakat. He said, you, she said, you should all be proud of these brothers. So they seem very close. And again, there's that picture from Empower Change on their Twitter account. So it says, hey, DHS government at De Department of Homeland Security, State Department, check out our bona fide Muslim family. No hashtag, no Muslim ban ever. ISNA 54. So again, there's Will. Now, will Yasser Qadi condemn the comments made by Linda Sarsour? Yasser Qadi, who is, qu I'm quoting James White here, the mentor of James White in these areas. Hmm. Time will tell. Okay. So that's the Linda Sarsour stuff. I think that's enough on that. Sadly, we're already 34, 36 minutes into the program. We'll see what we can get done. I'm probably going to have to spend more time on this on Monday's program. Unfortunately, I want to get, there's other topics I want to cover. Uh, I want to do a show on just plain introduction to Reformed Theology at some stage, and Lord willing, we'll be able to do that soon. Now, okay, now we're getting to what I wanted to cover first until a lot of this Linda Sarsour thing broke. On, J on June 19th, 2017, right after this controversy broke, Chris Aronson of Iron Sharpens Iron Radio had Phil Johnson on his program. This is uh, this is going to be hard for me. I, I, I hate doing this, probably because I, look, you know, when you say I know somebody, I've been on Chris Aronson's program three times. I thoroughly enjoyed every single program I looked for. I think it was three times. It might have been four. I'd have to go back and check. I really, really enjoyed being on his program. I really did. Uh, he comes across as an incredibly nice guy. As I believe Brandon House does as well. I'm sure, you know, so... This is not, certainly not personal in any way, shape, or form. By the way, yes, I have contacted Chris Arnzen about my concerns. Both publicly and privately. I, I think I left a message one time in absolute horror at his support of James White, and that has not changed. I love Chris Arnzen. I think he's... I have a lot of... You know, it, it, when it comes to the radio world, how many great... Christian interviewers are there out there? There's not many. And I I just really enjoyed the show, but I can't obviously this changes things. Phil Johnson, I had a huge amount of respect for, probably because of his stance that he took against Michael Brown. Well, a lot of people wouldn't. Even in one of my show notes, if you go back in some of my programs of Michael Brown, I actually I think I quoted Phil Johnson in one of the show notes. This kind of odd reverence that is let's see if i can find it now in the reformed baptist circles from michael brown even though michael brown is a, a charismatic with zero discernment this is phil johnson saying this now white james white really likes michael brown and we've we went through the article the last time the attempt to defend James White the last time, which is just filled with anecdotes. He talks, <laughs> Michael Brown talks about some guy he met in a trip to Germany from Ghana and said, you know, basically this unknown person. I don't care who it is, to be honest. It doesn't matter. It's, it's no authority there. Let's go through the scriptures, shall we? I know it might be a novel idea to some, but it was just anecdotes and, oh, this person said to me, it's a great idea. Oh, let's do this. Oh, well, that's great. M maybe not. Just because a lot of people have apparently got converted and also Michael Brown was involved in the Brownsville Revival. Go back and look at some of the videos on that. It was kind of people hysterics and barking and all this, it's weird, making weird sounds. And there's 
close connections between that. Is it as bad as the Toronto Blessings? No, but it's close, sadly. So I don't know why Michael Brown gets why anybody listens to them. And one of the few people who has actually had the guts to stick up to him is Phil Johnson. So it mystifies me that he will go after Michael Brown, but now when it comes to something much worse, he has no problem with it. Well, not no problem. He even states some of the concerns that he has and in order to get get through it there. So I'm going to see if I can pull up Phil Johnson's... Uh, I, Anyway, if you if you go to megidoradio.com, you'll be able to find it. Okay, let's start this. Look, I, I've i done this reluctantly. I'm not doing this. <laughs> Nobody put me up to this or any way, shape, or form. I was... I'll be honest, I was against doing this, and I advised people against going... I said... I remember talking to people, just, just leave... Kind of just leave the whole Phil Johnson thing alone. I'm I'm doing this for one reason only. I want to win a brother. Not a win a brother over to my side or that I'm correct or anything like that. I want Phil Johnson and Chris Aronson to be closer to the Lord. If by God's grace they listen to this. That there'll be repentance in the body of Christ where there needs to be repentance. And that God will be glorified. Has there sometimes been on the side that I'm on, you could say, been a bit of a scorch earth mentality and all that? At times there has been. We have to be honest. But all the people who have issues and concerns and are critics of James White, we're not all the same. <laughs> We've got different perspectives and I would certainly question the wisdom of many of the tweets and things like that that have been posted on my side. But I would argue that the behavior, I'm not saying this on, if you want to call it our side isn't perfect. No, of course not. It hasn't. But on the other side, I've just seen such vitriol. Anyway, I don't want to talk much more about that. Like, it is what it is. May the Lord open our eyes to see the truth. May the Lord guide us in this. And may we do this in love and respect for our brethren and that they will be one to the truth. Live from the. Yeah, I'm going to get the exact spot here. This is about 10 minutes into the program. And when you're just following the biblical text, it's, it, it wouldn't be an easy thing to go wildly in an unbiblical direction. So uh, I think that's what has framed his ministry over the years. And uh, Phil Johnson here, just to give a bit of context, is talking about the ministry of John MacArthur. So just in case you're wondering what he's talking about here. Uh, that's why he is, he is beloved. Amen. And of course... Like all true uh, followers of Christ, he's also uh, hated <laughs> uh, by those who are enemies of the gospel, enemies of truth, especially yeah. because he's a public figure. He's a world-renowned public figure. So um, that uh, that's always comes with the territory. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's inevitable. Jesus himself said, you know, woe to you when all men speak well of you. It's, it does come with the territory. If you're going to proclaim the truth, people who hate the truth will respond accordingly. You have to think about these comments as well. Okay, I would encourage you to listen to the whole program, etc. and so on. But the comments are made within the context of, okay, we're talking about what they're saying about the slander, apparently, against James White and all this kind of stuff. Um, that they're saying that enemies of the gospel are and enemies of truth hate those who's brethren I'm, I'm like if if either of you were listening you've got to be very careful we've all got to be very careful what we say can we just be in agreement on that 
it's so easy to let passions fly and end up doing far worse than you're accusing the other side of doing? Can we at least admit that it's easy to do that? Look, if you can show anywhere where I'm wrong, and I'm sure I've said maybe silly things over the last three programs, then I'll retract it, whatever. What was really disappointing for me on, and we, I dealt with in the last program with uh, my guest, Mark Fitzpatrick of Iron Reform Baptist Church. He's the pastor there. We looked at the fact that it was quite clear James White either hadn't even listened to the program or even listened to my argument. I never said that, that no gospel was presented. I said the gospel took second place. It became a footnote. It was in the background. Other things were put sent front and center, but it was barely mentioned. I think I mentioned it maybe five times in a two and a half hour episode. The only reason I know how many times I actually talked about it, my wife actually went through the show and made some notes on it. And anywhere where she found where I talked about it, she um, noted it down. Uh, I, I don't really listen back to myself. I kind of hate even editing the show after I finish. So. I try never to do it if I can help it. But anyway. So, here's the thing. If you want to go by that principle, and, and these comments have been made in terms of this controversy, a lot of Muslims are supporting James White here. A lot of Muslims. Go online. Go to Muslim Boy Choices' uh, YouTube channel or whatever. Look at the support James White is getting, and anybody who's criticizing him is seen as an is seen as a kind of an Islamophobic bigot and all this kind of stuff. Are the, is, are the Muslims enemies of Christ, or are the Christians with concerns enemies of Christ? And who is supporting white here? If we want to go away this principle, and because this is setting... Come on, this, you're not just making this comment on the fly. So, let's be very, very careful what we're saying here. They don't say it, but let's avoid any of this insinuation on either side. Okay? Let's deal with this. I want unity on this issue. I want repentance where it's needed. There needs to be church discipline in churches. You know, the eldership in the, in the churches involved, and have been supporting this, there needs to be some kind of repentance to say, look, and I don't know what, that church discipline looks like. I think we've got, here's what we've got to look for. The people on my side, we've got to look for, there's going to be church discipline. The one, especially James White, church discipline for him. What that looks like and how that, whatever, leave that to the church. We can't kind of, that's not our jurisdiction. That's not, we're not called to be elders and make the rulings and all that kind of stuff. We need to, we can only do what we can do. We can point out the error and pray and point it out to them. At that point, okay, okay, we can warn others about this, this topic. Not, I'm not talking about James White's moderated debates. I'm not talking about his books even. I'm not talking about all this stuff. But this one thing is so sickening and so serious that it compromises and tarnishes well, everything that's gone before, sadly. Whatever good that was before, it doesn't matter. It, you, you can serve Christ for 30 years perfectly. I mean, none of us are perfect, obviously. But, and I, look, I'm not saying... You can't go on somebody's pr prior track record. I need to get back into the program, I realize this, but... Anyway, let's play on. I mean, there's so many points I could make. Amen. Well, uh, we're going to uh, now get into our uh, theme today, a very vital theme, a theme that uh, I think uh, we should be addressing right now, especially in light of some ugly things that are occurring amongst brothers in Christ or professing Christians, and even some among some that were uh, friends at one point. It's just so sad to see. Uh, loving rebuke, crossing the line over to malicious slander and conduct on becoming a Christian. We're talking about Christ-like polemics. Perhaps, uh, Phil, if you could give a definition uh, 
uh, to what uh, polemics actually means? Uh, wow, I wish I'd looked up the word so I could give you a succinct definition. But polemics, polemics has to do with uh, arguing against error and, and in favor of the truth. And uh, in the church, we typically use the word polemics to talk about uh, uh, correction and needed critique uh, of errors that exist in the church within the within the body of believers. And we use the word apologetics to talk about. Um, you know, uh, defending the faith against errors that assault from the outside. Uh, so polemics is by nature argumentative, uh, and that's why it, it can be dangerous if that's all you ever do. Uh, you know, we are called to defend the faith, and one of the requirements for an elder in the church is that he has to be able to refute, you know, false teaching. Now, there's a common theme if you listen to the whole program and you can listen to us on Iron Sharpens Iron Radio. Now, just to be clear as well, I used to endorse Iron Sharpens Iron Radio. I asked Chris Aronson to remove that endorsement. I am not warning people about Chris Aronson at all or anything like that, but I don't recommend supporting them until they get this right. I'm not saying never again or anything like that. No, no, no. I think we can go overboard, but... <sighs> anyway, I mean, I, it, the whole thing saddens me, really, but... <sighs> Let's look at Phil Johnson. I actually found that quotation. This is what Phil Johnson said about... Michael Brown, a couple of years ago. And it's actually in the show notes I did on a show back in August 29th of 2015. The fact that Michael Brown has a kind of fan base, I think it was an article I wrote in him, has a kind of fan base among Reformed Baptists troubles me, but it doesn't sway my opinion of him. To exempt him from normal levels of doctrinal scrutiny or show him extreme deference just because he's a useful ally in the culture war, is not wise. That was that, my, that was that Phil Johnson. And you could say the same thing about him, but Michael Brown has been serving the Lord for how long? Started ministries around the world, defending the gospel, debater... No, no, this is ridiculous. Now, and he was criticizing him over an appearance on the Benny Hinn show. Give him context, like. And he's whitewashing, and I criticized him too over this, of Bill Johnson. And his defense of Mike, I don't know, did he comment on the Mike Bickle thing? But anyway, so for Bill Johnson to tear into somebody because I would have more patience for Michael Brown in this area. Why? Because at least it's possible, you could say, if you knew hardly anything about him, maybe Benny Hinn, okay, you didn't bother to do a Google search on him, you could kind of say, oh, well, he's okay. Uh, you know, I'll get a chance to share the gospel on his program. How many people get to share the gospel on Benny Hinn's program? Hmm? Let's make that argument. Oh, and how about Bill Johnson? Maybe I can be a positive influence and share the truth. And maybe people get saved and get out of there. Was that argument being made? Okay, we're going to come back to this, but I wanted to just show. Is there, and I want you to think about this. Is there inconsistency between Phil Johnson and Phil Johnson from a couple of years ago? Uh, and yet, uh, Scripture also says the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God will grant them repentance. Leading Look, and i got to point this out, and this is, I think, we've, I've, I've, I have bitten my tongue for years about this, about James White's behavior on Twitter, on Facebook, he takes the low-hanging fruit, he goes after them, makes a public example of them, embarrassing them in public, and dragging their name through the mud. 
sometimes legitimately, what I mean legitimately, some things are, some websites make foolish mistakes about what he said and things like that, okay? But just, how about just contact them if they're attracted, great. Um, and, but no, 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 James White wants a perpetual war. You know, and Pulpit and Pain and groups like that. So, it, it's interesting he, they bring up all these verses, but how many quarrels and how many... The way James White is with much of his program, his debates are, a bit di his debates are different, but he is on his program on the dividing line. It's basically, you get... It's like the equivalent of the, 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 the school bully getting the smallest person, the weakest guy in the whole school to beat him up to show everybody how strong he is and then nobody's to mess with him. And he does that theologically with people. Doesn't actually, And a lot of times he really doesn't debunk people. He just says, well, you know, we've talked about this before and this is clearly stupid or something like that. Those are the kind of comments and this is the kind of quote-unquote refutation that takes place a lot of the time. Not always. Some of the refutations are quite good. And, but I think, honestly, that was a couple of years ago. Now, his debates are different. I'm not saying his debates are di not different. His debates and his books, pretty solid. But that does not exempt him from cr criticism of his behavior. Of the qu like he quite clearly has loads of quarrels with people on Facebook. Okay? He turns up on my page and starts a Facebook page and has a load of fights with people. I don't directly respond to him. I've never directly responded to him, actually. Uh, Twitter. Just look at his tweets. But people say, well, what's the problem with that? And that's probably the problem. Maybe we've become numb to his behavior online. But I digress. Anyway, so we're talking about quarrelsome. I've made no secret of the fact, and I did a critique of his just purely for edification of the body of Christ. It wasn't really a sermon or warning people about him. He did his critique on, on um, his view of baptism and things like that, because I think he did a debate two years ago with Greg Strawbridge, and I think, I don't know a lot about Greg Strawbridge, but Greg Strawbridge's um, defense of infant baptism was pretty poor, in my opinion. And um, so I kind of wanted to do a response to that, didn't have a massive problem with, I just mentioned, not a big fan, but would have never really taken it any further or seen any need to take it any further. But now it is needed because of the kind of cult of personality that is around them. Okay? I'm not saying Phil or Chris worship him. I don't know. I can't get inside their hearts, but I can see the activity of people that just run to the defense of him and say what a great servant of the Lord he is and all that. But how about G.I. Packer? Anybody could say that. Look at all the great books. And G.I. Packer put out some great books. I haven't actually read any of them, but I'm taking people's word for it. i seen a lot of quotations. He seems like G.I. Packer seems like amazing. Like he's amazing. I haven't bought them because I knew about evangelicals and Catholics together a couple of years ago. But he has, and he's still quoted by people. Because of all these great work, but you know, one silly thing where he kind of sold out the gospel. Now, did Jay, I'm not saying that James White has gotten that far as J.I. Packer has gotten. I'm not saying that. But this is the precursor part. Let's continue. ...to the knowledge of the truth. And it's, it's, it's too easy, I think, when you, when you spend too much time doing polemics or even apologetics to... to uh, to become argumentative and in, an, in a way that sort of nullifies or, or, or goes against this biblical command to be gentle and, and kind to all and patient when wronged and all of that. Yes, and in fact, wouldn't you agree, I'm sure you would agree, that the thing that is most typically lacking amongst evangelicals today or any sort of polemics. I mean, uh, today, polemics would be uh, considered just out-and-out out nastiness, e even if you're being as kind and gracious as you can be. Uh, yeah. in, in fact, 
I completely agree, but by what standard do we decide this? Chris, I think even you and I have had, uh, we did a radio interview once about the fact that uh, the, the idea of defending the truth or refuting error has become a, an odious idea in the Church, so much so that people aren't doing that, and it, it is a duty of Church leaders uh, to, to refute error, to point out what's wrong, to warn the sheep against wolves that may come even in sheep's clothing. And uh, people don't like to do that today. They want everything to be positive. But there's also a kind of overreaction against that, where you've got people who have, have made themselves into sort of full-time critics, and they, they love the conflict more than they love the truth. That, I think, is, is the real problem. And it's easy for that to happen. Um, but anybody can make exactly the same accusation, and I've heard, seen people make the same accusation, with you, Phil Johnson, because you have been, you've been blocked from Michael Brown's Twitter account and all this kind of stuff. And look, we've all got our thing that really annoys us. And for Phil Johnson, it's the charismatic movement. So, who is he talking about here? Any of the major big, you know, the big ones you think of off the top of your head, but whether it's Worldview Weekend or Noise of Thunder Radio, Chris Pinto, or oh, Pulpit and Pen, the Polemics Report with J.D. Hall. There's some other ones that I can't even... Oh, Chris Rose Bros, uh, Park Christian Radio. Who is he talking about? Because all of those programs don't just do... I can't think of any that just could do criticism, 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 criticism. I'm not 100% sure about Pulpit and Pen, to be honest. I've only, I've only seen some articles. It's possible. I don't accuse them of something. Not, it's possible. that I don't know if they do positive teaching and just kind of go, okay, we're going to teach through this doctrine and all that. I presume J.D. Hall with polemics report i haven't listened to enough pro enough programs to actually form an opinion so i don't know but who who are you talking about and look you know pulpit and pain and polemics report and all, all of, they've hardly been the biggest critics the biggest critic has been let's be honest brandon house most prominent one at least who has he been constantly constantly and look I was on his program a few days ago. We we acknowledge to each other, of course, we don't agree in eschatology. We don't agree on, I'm not exactly sure where he lines up on a couple of different issues, but I believe he's a Christian and loves the Lord. And I was really surprised when he wanted to have me on his network. And I was like, uh, okay. Kind of, I was kind of in shock when he asked me. And we've probably spent a couple of hours back and forth, different times, various times in Skype. And it's, kind of a bit weird when somebody you've been listening to on radio on and off for a couple of years rings you up, but you know, he's a pretty normal guy and he's just really concerned about this issue. Does he get it right all the time? I probably would say he didn't. He doesn't get it right all the time, but neither do I. But who are you talking about? You see, this is just this kind of nebulous catch-all to any of the critics and it's just going to come across that way. If If you don't mean to do that, it's it's badly presented. You need to give us concrete examples. I can't say that everybody who's supporting white on this issue is horrible and is this X, Y, and Z. I can't. I don't know. I can only go on some individuals and then I should point out, and this is kind of what I'm doing here because Phil Johnson and Chris Aronson support um, James White, but they're not... Ex but even they don't even agree with each other in a couple of different finer points here and there. So, and how they would... But I digress. Let's continue. When, when someone just devotes himself full-time to being a critic. I got an email or a, a message online earlier this week from a, a guy who said, look, I'm thinking of becoming a full-time apologist. What kind of good advice can you give me? And my, my answer was... Don't, you know, if the Lord's calling you to full-time ministry, 
be a pastor or a teacher or an evangelist and do apologetics well, but those are roles in the church, pastor, a teacher, an evangelist. There's nothing in Ephesians 4 about being a full-time apologist. And I think we, we let, let ourselves in for uh, a grave danger when we devote ourselves full-time to being a critic. I think this is a kind of a weak argument, but I won't dwell on it too much. <sighs> These are not church roles. For example, this is a radio program. I do. I make films every now and again. Don't do them as much as I'd like. I write articles and things like that. But it's not a church office, okay? And the much higher calling is to be called to be a pastor or an elder in the church. Far greater. And, and Lord willing, we will never, ever diminish that. And to be honest, if the church is in a healthy state, a lot of, you know... There would be no need for stuff like mine or Brandon Houses or anybody else. I just think that you know, if the church was in a healthy state in a lot of the world, you know, we'd probably be irrelevant, and that would be wonderful because a lot of the stuff would be dealt with from the pulpit. And look, what we should aim to do anybody in, I hate that term, discernment ministry, but uh, whatever, anybody in that field. Why? Because it's such a, it's, it almost seems like a slur been thrown around now. Oh, you're constantly negative and all this kind of stuff. I want to go back. I'm going to try and do some shows soon on just plain Reformed theology, what it is, and things like that. But even when you're, quote-unquote, being positive, you have to point out some errors and what, what, what it isn't. Okay? So, but I would give people advice that the greatest calling, and he's right, the greatest calling is to be a minister, full-time minister, you know, think about that before you think about being an apologist, but there's nothing wrong about being an apologist. You know, the, the Puritans talked about regular principle of worship. Again, I don't want to dwell on this too much. You know, roles within the church, worship and all that is set out, but things outside of the church, there's normative principle of worship. It's not regulated. If we do, if we start saying that, you know, that there's, you know, you might as well say there's no radio show host. We shouldn't do that. There's no Christian bookshops either mentioned in Ephesians chapter 4. So I, it's a mild concern just with that argument. Just be careful with it. But not really a big deal. Let's continue. Yes, and uh, there, we need to be, I think, very clear uh, how to distinguish uh, just, rightful, appropriate and perhaps even mandatory polemics uh, in contrast to that. Okay, they're going to go. I'm going to skip on about five minutes just for the sake of time because I don't want to spend too long on this. He kind of makes the point, you know, there's times when you do do polemics and you should do polemics. I would make the argument that it seems to be easier to do the polemics when it's somebody who's not in your immediate circle. Okay? An observation. It's a lot easier for those in John MacArthur's circle to go after uh, Michael Brown or any other charismatic for that matter than it is, let's be honest, it's easier to do that than in our, you could say, our Reformed club. Hmm? I'm not denying that. It's more difficult. If it's a friend of a friend or a friend of yours or somebody you really care about, it's harder. You don't want to do it. Who wants to do that? I didn't want to do this program, but it, unfortunately, I just feel because of the insinuations and the accusations been laid out in this program and, I'll be honest, the behavior of Chris Irons and supporting um, that horrendous program by James White called Screenshot Insanity, basically mocking anybody, going around to people's Facebook. and Yeah, you're going to find... All sorts of poor behavior, just for a guy who's written over 20 books and had how many debates, is stalking your own Facebook and Twitter, looking for things to look at. Oh, look at my opposition. They're crazy. This is horrendous. This is so childish. Does it need to be pointed out? I'm not saying you can't reply every now and again, but the, to the degree at which he does it, Oof, I wanna... Ay. So we're going to skip ahead now, if we're going to remember to... Yeah. 
This is up to the 20 minute mark. It was, uh, in fact, it was before, I believe it was before 9-11, before 2001. Now that I'm thinking yeah, about it. That's, that's why I asked the date. I, I thought, I, I remember after uh, September 11th that James, I don't, I don't remember how long it was, but uh, Dr. White, sort of announced that he was going to devote himself to learning something about Islam and, and becoming uh, uh, and making that one of the focuses of his apologetic and I was so thankful for that because I know he's a he's a careful scholar he he, he doesn't just fly off the handle or uh, you know debate things on supposition or whatever so I knew he would study the subject and and learn it well and he even to the point where he took Arabic so he could read uh, the Quran in, in its original language. Now, forgive me if I'm wrong, but it just sounds, it just sounds a little bit like James is very smart. He knows what he's doing. I don't really understand it all, but he does. He's a careful scholar. That is so dangerous. Can we see how dangerous that mentality is? We're putting our trust and our confidence in men. I don't care who it is. There are times when godly men will gravely err and they need to be corrected for the sake of their testimony, things like that. Do you think the godly man can't sin? Can't do things that will destroy their testimony? Could you imagine, just say it was a man walks with the Lord really strongly, and this is just an analogy, I'm not talking about any particular example. Just say somebody's, you know, I'm, I'm sharing the gospel with this woman, and he ends up spending loads of time with this woman. He's sharing the gospel, sharing the gospel. Has an impeccable, you know, from a human point of view, reputation among Christians and seen as a model Christian. What if then, because he's spending so much time with this woman sharing the gospel, who's not his wife, he ends up having an affair. Do we say to that person who's fallen into sin, but look at all the things he did, if we criticize him in this area, and he may have preached some of the greatest sermons, blessed so many people with his preaching, but are you saying that somebody can't fall into error? That is foolish thinking, if you are thinking like that. All of us, me included, any of us, can fall into grievous sin. Now, will we continue in it if we're a Christian? No. But we don't say, look at their back, look at the track record, look how smart he is, look at how much he's dedicated himself. So, he's exempt. And to quote again from Phil Johnson... From a couple of years ago. Oh, I can't, I'm after exiting out of the quotation there. That to exempt somebody from normal levels of scrutiny, it's dangerous. It doesn't matter who it is. You've you got to appreciate someone who works that hard uh, at the task of apologetics. Oh, yeah, he has grown light years in his knowledge of Islam since the days of Hamza Abdul Malik. He uh, has read the Quran, I don't know how many times over, uh, but has studied it in great depth to the point where the last debates that I arranged for him in New York with Muslims. This kind of talk does not do anybody any good. Okay, we praise the Lord for servants, but we don't say that, the, oh, he's so amazing, he's so great. I keep hearing people talk about James White like this. Look, his book, What Every Christian Needs to Know About the Quran, is a basic level introduction. Islam is, you know, in some of its terminologies and stuff like that, it's complex because you've got the Hadith, the Sahih Muslim, Sahih Bukhari, huge collections to study and go through. And there's a lot of stuff. His book, <laughs> all right, it's good. But let's not get carried away. That, oh, yeah, he's got a good book, so and therefore he knows everything about it. That's kind of ridiculous. This is kind of a good entry-level thing, and it's great that it was written, 
on the Trinity and other things like that. But it's basic. It doesn't go into a lot of things. It doesn't go into you know, complex Islamic history, except for some of the textual issues and stuff like that. But let's not overblow and say that this is the greatest book ever written. No, there's better books. Now, has there been as Christian of a book written? No, that's, you know, I'm not saying that either. Like Robert Spencer's works have been much more scholarly, much more detailed, but unfortunately not from a Christian perspective. So, you know, I welcomed this book when it came out. And but not because it was the great... It's, it's a good book. I don't want to knock it or anything like that. But here's the thing. That makes him more responsible. The more knowledge he has, the more responsibility he has. The more I expect of him. James White acknowledges that he is not as nice and patient with Christians as he, has, as he is Muslims because he said, and I think it was the last program... I expect more of them. I expect Christians to act like Christians. Well, here's the thing. I expect more from James White because he studied Islam for as long as he has. So I'm going to, using James White's own logic here, criticize him more heavily than I will Phil Johnson, who doesn't have much knowledge of Islam, or Chris Aronson for that matter. Okay? Is that okay? It was very painfully apparent that he knew more about the Quran than the imams he was debating. And when I say painfully, not for the Christians in the audience, it was painfully apparent to the Muslims in the audience that he knew far more, in, in certain areas anyway, about the Quran than, than his Islamic opponents did. And uh, so he has uh, really become one of the... Uh, individuals in Christian apologetics that is in the forefront today of debating Muslims. And uh, this, uh, this whole uh, clamor arose. Look, this, is, this argument comes up in the... He is the best person out there. He's probably one of the best. He's at the forefront. He's challenging Muslims. And then some whippersnappers come around to upset the apple cart. Can we? There's a ma there are a massive personality cults in Christianity today. Massive. We shouldn't. There's a man I know. I'm not going to mention his name. And every time I talk to him, I have one of his books. It is. Okay, from a writing point of view, is it the best book ever? No, but it's from a Christian perspective and the things that it has in it, it is amazing. Seriously. I love the book. And I was telling him how, you know, one of a few times, I love this book, it's a fantastic book. He doesn't stick around for accolades. He doesn't even want to be acknowledged. He is the most low-key man. He's a servant of God. He's a minister. He doesn't want the limelight. The person who loves Christ is going to speak as little about himself as possible. One of the things that scares me, can I be honest here? One of the things that scares me about going on Worldview Weekend Radio um, network. It's not Brandon House. It's not on the other people there. It's my heart. Will you um just keep me in prayer? Because um I don't want this program to be about me. It's just so easy to, you start off, everything's about Christ, and then some people say things about you, and you end up defending yourself, defending yourself, defending yourself. And before you know it, it's all about people saying nasty things about you, and not about defending the gospel. That 
terrifies me, and I am foolish and ignorant if I think that I cannot fall into that error. Uh, when people started uh, thinking that Dr. White was compromising too much in his exchanges and in interactions with Muslims, and then when he had a recent two-day event where a Muslim was given uh, more freedom to speak by design uh, at a church on the first day, and then the second day, Dr. White was given more freedom to speak by design in a mosque. People went into a rage about that, and even a couple of whom were uh, James White's uh, former friends. Uh, but the, the difference between disagreeing with that strategy, and, and then I'll say right here that I, I've been accused of treating James White like an untouchable like he is some kind of an idol, that he is some kind of uh, a, uh, a a demigod or something, where I, he is unapproachable and, and you dare not criticize him for anything. I, I don't view Dr. White like that at all. Uh, it's not a good argument to say, well, I don't think that. I don't know. I I don't know Chris well enough. And I don't want to make a judgment on his heart. But I just pray that that's not the case. That's all I can say. I pray that that's not the case. And just to say, well, that's not true. Look, if you get attacked and criticized about things, my advice to you is ignore it. Christ did not respond to every false accusation. Neither should we. There are times to possibly state the facts about things clearer name if necessary, but most of the time it's not necessary, and actually most of the time, even if you're cl clarifying some error, it's basically somebody baiting you. I'm saying if you're genuine and somebody's really... Ignore it. We, you know why we get offended when somebody says something that's not true about us? It's our pride. We want... Here's the thing, right? You might have said, you know what? That person said something horrible. I think this is a Charles Spurgeon quote, actually. That person said something horrible about me. You know what? If only they knew how wretched and horrible it was. You know, the quote from, you know, this analogy used by Paul Washer sometimes. If I could take your thoughts and put, for the last five, ten minutes, put them on a large screen in front of your best friend, you'd run out of the room in embarrassment. We have thought things so horrendous, so horrible, that our best friends would never probably want to look at us in the eye again. Pe people said horrible things about Christ. What are we more concerned about? The truth? The impact on our brothers and sisters in Christ in this error? Or the people, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even talking about Chris Irons here. I'm not, I'm not, I'm talking about across the internet. I'm talking about in general. I actually am here. People say all sorts of nasty stuff on the internet. Of course, I get them every day. I mean, forget it, honestly. There was a pastor guy on Twitter. He called me at, you know, I said, I don't think it was, what was it? Something, what was the tweet? Are you enjoying your 30 pieces of silver or something like that? You know, just mute it and move on. Like, pray for the person and just move on. What can you do? We can have an hour. Oh, that's not true. What's it going to achieve? So anyway, let's continue. Again, that was more of an aside. This is not in any way, shape, or form to be criticizing Chris on this, on this exact point. And... I think that there is a legitimate sphere of uh, reasons why someone might, as a brother in Christ, disagree with that strategy and, and might make that disagreement uh, known publicly. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, I've been arranging these debates 
uh, since 1995 with Dr. White uh, and most recently with Dr. Tony Costa of the Toronto Baptist Seminary. And there have been a handful of people that I love, admire, and respect, a small handful who have said to me, Chris, I really uh, would w- I would really hope that you don't have debates anymore, public debates, or arrange them, because you're giving a platform for an enemy of the gospel to proselytize an audience. Now, I am not, I'll be honest, I'm not the biggest fan of debates and stuff like that, but I would never, that would be, yeah, I would say, we can have d- disagreements. I don't think it's, clearly sinful to have debates and all that i i'm a bit i i'd have concerns about them but i never do programs and all the, and go nuclear on it about a debate i wouldn't do them because usually the muslim in the presentation is blaspheming christ because he rejects christ and he brings another gospel but at least in a debate there's a refutation offered by the christian and said that's wrong here's the truth at least that happens in a debate. Okay? This is different. If you can't see the categorical difference, th- this is a false equivalency. Yes, it can be b- people, disagreements and debates and all that kind of stuff. I would question how much fruit has been come out of the apologetics world, but again, that would be kind of brothers and sisters in Christ will have difference in opinion, right? However, there's a massive difference between that and him bringing a guy into it to the, before God's people and some Muslims and saying to them, Dr. Qadi, sir, you honor us with your presence. Telling him to make a video to teach his errors. Something forbidden in Second John verses nine to eleven. For anybody who brings another Christ has got another gospel. Anybody, let's go to Second John actually. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there, if there come any unto you that bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. For he that bideth him, biddeth him God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. Anyone under the guise of a preacher, this is all the commentaries are the same. Who come? This is not just talking about the proto Gnosticism of the first century. If you just say, oh, it's only those people in that situation, this is James White's ar- argument actually on his, on his, uh, at AOMN.org, the article he wrote. He said, oh, it doesn't apply to, basically, it only applies to, said this, I'll quote him here, importantly, this is the context that immediately precedes our text, for that of the apostates who are once part of the church, but do not teach Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, the early docetics. So now, and I'm just going to skip on to what he says here. At the end, he says, so with these things in mind, we see that this passage teaches us to examine the doctrine of Christ. Christian teachers, and to not give a basis for operation in our communities. So, to examine the doctrine of Christian teachers. Now, do you mean within the visible church? Could Mormons come? They're not in the visible church. Could Roman Catholics come? They're not in the visible church. So, who are you saying are Christian? I'm presuming... You're talking about those who do not profess Christ. However, Muslims do say that you need to love and serve Christ, by the way. You know, that he was a prophet. Yasir Qadi even said it during the talk. 
Now, one of the arguments, this is in another program that James White made, was, you know, that it was nonsense that the that a Muslim imam came in and preached to the Christians. That's not, he said, that's not what happened. Well, I would say this. If you say that on the first night, the imam did not get to preach the gospel according to Islam, that, sir, you did not preach the gospel according to Jesus Christ on the second night. Now, I'm not even saying that that's true. But if you say that on the second night, cry, uh, that James White preached the gospel, then you also have to, by the same standard, because it was in the same exact manner, that Yasser Qadi preached the gospel according to Islam on the first night. There's never an excuse for sin. There's never an excuse for blasphemy. There's never an excuse for promoting a false gospel or to allow it to be propagated. Just because we get to share our gospel does not... <laughs> we do not do evil that good may come of it. That is wickedness. That is, a, that is not trusting in the sovereignty of God. That is not tr trusting in the providence of God. We obey God in every area, and we, we know that God is in control of all things. The results are in his hand. We are to obey him in either small or large ways or whatever it is. What did Phil Johnson say on this passage when talking about 2 John verses 9 to 11? What did he say back in 2011? September of 2011. Brandon House was interviewing him. I'm going to play this whole clip. This is four minutes. He's not talking about interfaith dialogue here, to be clear. But he does talk about 2 John 9 to 11. He also used 2 John 9 to 11 in his criticism of Michael Brown. What? Pay close attention when we're listening to this. What does Phil Johnson, what did Phil Johnson say a couple of years ago that 2 John verses 9 to 11 implies? I guess is now to be a believer that you're trying to bring America back to God. That's some of the fruit now that proves you're a Christian. I just don't see that in the scriptures. Yeah, you know, I listened to that broadcast. Uh, I'm not that familiar with wall builders and what they normally do, but it, it, from that broadcast... Again, I, I know, I just want to make sure that we're clear here. This is not talking about interface dialogue. But listen to what he says about Second John verses nine to eleven. I know I'm being a bit going back over things again. So I want it to be very clear. What does Phil Johnson say about Second John nine to eleven? In now, this is top of political alliances and all this kind of stuff. In the name of promoting the Christian religion, but, but let's, let's listen. Podcast. It's it seems to me that they've they've reduced pretty much everything that's important to a handful of political issues. And, uh, you know, I think the thing you read about Moody said that for their failure to distinguish between Mormonism and evangelical Christianity, I would say it's more like a refusal to make any distinction. They, mm. they, are, they are consciously and deliberately refusing to acknowledge the vast differences between the neo-Gnostic ideas of Mormonism and, and what Scripture teaches. And that... That is that's worse than confusing. It's it, it's uh, it's just wrong. It's wrong. And Moody did right to take them off the radio station for saying those kinds of things. What they what they've done is uh, listen to the language of uh, uh, Beck's testimony and how Jesus changed his life. And what they're what they're saying rather insistently there is that that's a sufficient testimony of faith in Christ. That isn't what Scripture teaches. The central issue of the gospel is justification by faith. And if you read the book of Galatians, that was the very doctrine that was under attack uh, in the Galatian churches by men who, like Beck, professed to be Christians. They affirmed probably 95% of the apostolic doctrine. But on this one point, this one issue, they differed with the apostles and said, no, 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 you're not justified by faith alone. You have to be circumcised. So you're justified by faith plus works. Something you do becomes the instrument of justification. And Paul said, if anybody comes... Now, 
I just want to point out, that's just laying the groundwork because I don't want to be taking out of context. He's not talking about interfaith dialogue here, but he's talking about a very similar situation, and he uses, in a second, Second John verses 9 to 11 to apply to say, basically, in a, in a spiritual endeavor... Let's listen to what he says. ...and brings a different doctrine like that. Let him be damned. Galatians 1, verses 8 and 9. Paul says it twice, just so that nobody misses it. Let them be accursed. And he's essentially saying you can't teach such a twisted notion of the gospel and be an authentic Christian. You just can't. And, and so if anybody comes to you with a twisted doctrine of the gospel like that, Treat them as an unbeliever. Don't listen to them. Don't don't. Uh, John says, the gospel or uh, the the second epistle of John, uh, verses seven through eleven. He... Really listen to this now. I mean, this is so important. Uh, verses seven through eleven. He says, if somebody comes to you w- with a different Christ, basically with a different doctrine of Christ, uh, don't let them. Don't even let them in your house. Don't... If anyone cr- comes with another Christ. If anyone comes with another Christ, don't even let them in your home. Even give them a greeting. And he says, if you give them a greeting, you're a partaker in their evil deeds. Did you get that? If you let them into your home, if you encourage them, if you give them a greeting, you are a partaker of their evil deeds. And again, look, the, listen to the preaching of John MacArthur. And he says, and we played it another show, I think it was uh, two shows ago, that this is an issue of church discipline. That's what John MacArthur th- said. So, is something going to be done about the public stance changing of Grace to you, the executive director of Grace to you? He's representing that body. I know he's in the Grace Life pulpit and all that. Let's continue. So, Scripture treats this sort of doctrinal deviancy is something very, very serious. And to say, to basically sweep all that away and say, look, doctrine doesn't matter, it's just a different label, is to dissemble, I believe, intentionally to obscure what Scripture's taking, uh, what Scripture is teaching very clearly, and, in, and to do that for the sake of a political agenda, or our, to protect our political alliances. Now, you might think that this does not apply at all to the Yasser Qadi James White issue. It does. And I'm going to play a clip from the talk itself proving that, that this is what is being suggested here, that that was talked about during the, the White Qadi controversy, yeah. or there's, during the talk, I mean. There's an echo in that of what uh, God repeatedly condemned the Israelites for making alliances with unbelievers out of political expediency. Making alliances with unbelievers for political expediency. That's what he said. Yeah, and that's the next topic I wanted to get into with you, because um, in the program yesterday, Rick Green says, you're not a church, David, you're not a church. You know, so Brandon's concern here, I mean, um, you're not a church. Okay, so... Well, because the, commands, the commands in uh, Galatians 1, not to listen to anybody who comes with a different gospel, uh, 2 John 7 through 11, not to, not to even greet anybody who comes preaching a different Christ, and uh, uh, 2 Corinthians uh, six fourteen, don't be unequally yoked together with unbeliever, unbelievers. All of those commandments are given to individual Christians, not to churches collectively. That's not about who the church fellowships with. That's about who we as Christians uh, yoke ourselves to. Did you hear that? It's not just about the church. According to Phil Johnson from 2011, I just would love to know how his exegetical understanding has changed so much. But because apparently, according to James White, that that understanding is sad, to use his own word. That apparently, oh, that's only if you're marrying a Muslim in second... Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Now, I want to give Bill Johnson the benefit of the doubt as much as possible. Maybe here you have made a grave mistake. Bill, it's not too late. Do you know what? If you come out and just say, you know, I made a mistake, this is wrong, then I will be one of the first people to say, fantastic, bravo, let's move on. You are not my enemy, 
Chris Aronson, you are not my enemy. In James White, you're not my enemy. I want to see repentance in the body of Christ. I do not point this out because I have contempt towards you. In, in spiritual I- endeavors, it's not, it's not suggesting, you know, you shouldn't shop at a grocery store owned by individual Christians. Not to- now, individual Christians, how they join in alliances for various means, okay? Let's churches listen. collectively. That's not about who the church fellowships with. That's about who we as Christians uh, yoke ourselves to. In, in spiritual I- endeavors, it's not, it's not suggesting, you know, you shouldn't shop at a grocery store owned spiritual endeavors. What would you call teaching about God? Is that not a spiritual endeavor? By an unbeliever or whatever. It means you shouldn't make this very sort of political alliance in some kind of spiritual endeavor uh, for the sake of political expediency. My guest is uh, Phil Johnson with Okay, that's the end of that clip. So ser- clearly, there is an inconsistency. I mean, if you're going back a couple of years, well, not a couple of years, when was this? This is Phil Johnson's rebuke of Michael Brown. And one of the comments, and I'm not a big fan of doing this, you know, going back in comments that were put on Facebook, But just to give you an idea of some of the things that Phil Johnson was saying about Michael Brown, he says, In light of Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 to 9, and 2 John 7 to 11, I have a hard time excusing it as a blind spot. Now, compare Benny Hinn. Now, I know Benny Hinn's a charlatan, and Phil Johnson is too, and all this kind of stuff. Grant, okay, fine. And... But their false gospel, can we just admit that it's hard to see that they preach a false Jesus and a false gospel, and it's so deceptive, right? Much more so than the Muslim. The Muslim doesn't even claim or pretend that Jesus, as it says in Second John, they don't pretend to have the doctrine of Christ. They deny he is God Almighty. So they don't even pretend. So you could have more of an understanding for Michael Brown being deceived and duped, using his own words, by the way, from his article where he talked about gullibility, the great sin of the charismatic church, which he wrote in Charisma magazine, I think about a year ago. And I, I did a program on that as well. Just ty- type in Michael Brown into the search engine in uh, megataradio.com. So, why do you think it's worse? If you're a young Christian, who do you think is going to be more like, are you, are you more likely to think that Benny Hinn is saved and going to heaven? Like, I mean, how would I put it? I'm going to be very careful what I say here. I know, I know, I know that James White is not teaching that Yasser Khadi is going to heaven. I know this, okay? Before that accusation gets labeled out there. I know this. However, because Yasser Khadi is a teacher, he's bringing another Christ, he talks about Christ, he says it's a misconception to say that Muslims are not to believe in Jesus and all that stuff. But we want to really stick on the point here. He brought up 2 John 7, 2 John verses 7 to 11, criticizing Michael Brown and his association with Benny Hinn and all these other people. He said he's a hard time excusing it as a blind spot when someone constantly dogmatically promotes heretics and false prophets who twist and obscure the gospel message as blatantly as Bill Johnson or Benny Hinn do. I'm sure Dr. Brown is a very likable person with a lot of good qualities. A reliable judge of heretics and heresy hunters, he is not. Nor is he a safe teacher to recommend to brothers and sisters seeking biblical, sound biblical and doctrinal instruction. Okay? So he brings in that verse. So, 
And I know you probably say, okay, he's part of the visible church and all that. But anybody who brings another Christ. And he clearly applied it outside of the pale of the visible church. Spiritual alliances. This is what he said back in 2011. But you say, okay, but where are these spiritual alliances? Okay, let's go back to the talk. This is the talk where this whole controversy started about. This was back in January of this year. This is 59 minutes and 24 seconds into the talk. Uh, folks, this is what you need to understand. I have taken heat from people on my side because those of you who know me know I have a, I have a mantra, consistency consistency. For example, when, when I interact with, with Muslims in debate, I do not use many of the arguments that are popular out there because I believe we have to have even scales. And so, um, for example, there are Orientalists who question even the existence of the historical Muhammad or things like that. Um, I will not utilize that kind of radical deconstructionist mm -hmm. type argumentation, even though sometimes it's used against me. Um, I have to use the same standards in defending my faith that I use in disagreeing with someone else's position. I think that's necessary for a Christian for the simple reason that we follow him who is the way, the truth, and the life. Therefore, my arguments have to be what? Truthful. They have to be representative of what the other side is saying. And so, in light of that, uh, when we look at an, how many billion Muslims are there in the world? 1.6 billion. Okay, 1.6 billion people. We do not like it when we are all thrown into one big basket and people, for example, most of you know that I have dealt with the issue of homosexuality. I've done debates on the subject of homosexuality for, for many, many years, all the way back to 2001. And yet people will hold me accountable for the Westboro Baptist Church people and things like that. And I'm like, wait a minute. That's not my life. That's not how I've approached people. That's not my perspective. I do not want to be painted with that brush. I demand the right of self-definition of what my faith is. We all demand that right. And yet, for many Christians, we refuse that right to Muslims. And because there are Muslims who do bad things and give theological arguments from it, and quote... Not going to spend a long time in it, but just really, really quickly, it's really despicable to compare what Westboro Baptist Church is to Christianity is quite clearly refutable, easily refutable from the Bible. However, ISIS and other groups like that, Boko Haram and all this kind of stuff, Al-Qaeda, back to the early caliphs and all that, clearly taught violent jihad against and subjugation of unbelievers. This is easily provable from the Quran and Hadith. There's no comparison between them. Just briefly point that out, but I really want to, I'm going to play a large chunk just to show how, where this is going. And it's admitted in the talk from the same Sunnah that you quote from, because of that, then there are many Christians that will say, they are the consistent Islam, this is the aberration, and we need to treat them all in the same way. And I consider that to be hypocrisy. We can't do that. I recognize the fact that there are different perspectives amongst the Muslim people. And, if, and folks, from a Christian perspective, if we want, and I hate stopping it every five seconds, but there's different perspectives. But he says he is consistent. Obviously, using a bit of logic here, you would classify anybody who probably disagrees with Yasser Qadi as being very inconsistent, maybe. Then, to express the love of Christ to other people, then we have to listen to where they are and address them where they are and accept what they say is their faith. No one disagrees with that, actually. Well, I don't disagree with that at all. Meet people where they're at. I'm not saying you start throwing the Aisha argument at Muslims as soon as you start talking to them. I've never even brought that up with a Muslim. Um, I might mention a radio program. That's a bit different. But I, I'll ask him what they believe. That's different. Nobody's against dialogue here. Again, this is a straw man and meet them where, that, where, where they are. We can't dem demand that they hold to views that are not theirs in the first place. And so when someone is willing to risk their lives to stand against what ISIS is doing, the way that Dr. Qadi does, I, I have such a tremendous respect for that. That's why I want you to hear what he's saying now as to what it's like uh, to experience life. And I want us to be people who recognize that 
and can therefore come alongside and can pray for individuals and can extend the hand of friendship. Um, because folks, in case you haven't noticed, our culture... This is a very, very important section. This is, this is the part I wanted to play up to because I, you know, I just didn't want to be people saying, no context. Um, this is playing quite a lengthy section here in order to show where this is leading. This is James White speaking now and can extend the hand of friendship um, because folks in case you haven't noticed our culture is becoming much more secular and I know we're down south and you might say well Massachusetts yeah okay uh, Northern California okay no it's coming everywhere and the fact of the matter is um, we all may be facing being a religious minority how are we going to get along in that situation? Are we going to want someone to come alongside us? Then we need to extend the hand now. And so I appreciate the fact that uh, now, now. What else is that talking about? Extending the hand, partnership, coming alongside. This is a partnership. What fellowship hath light with darkness? This is condemned in the scriptures. What, you're going to look to Islam for the preservation of the Christian faith? Or you can look to God. We are not allowed to do this. And Phil Johnson of 2011 also condemned this as well on Brian House's program a couple, how many years is that now? Six years ago. For spiritual alliances, you know, for spiritual enterprises and stuff like that, this is a spiritual enterprise. What to preserve what the religions. I do want to say this, what you need to do is there needs to be, here's what I would, I would invite you to do if you, have, if you ever have the time to do it. My community needs to have someone with your ability to clearly present things. Take what you've written about the Karajites, about these things, who speaks for Islam, and produce a, an hour long YouTube video that we can understand that would say, this is how you know what the true Islam is. These are our sources, and these are where these people have gone. Not a lot of people can do that, and I'll be honest with you, some of the stuff that's out there is stultifyingly boring. Mm -hmm. And I mean, honestly, I saw a cleric sitting there in a one-camera shoot, and I fell asleep after five minutes, and I know, at least I knew what he was saying. Mm -hmm. Someone with your ability to communicate, with your passion, we need something like that. We really, really do. Would you agree? Go ahead. It's all right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, let me just let me just add here. Okay, that's as much as I'm going to play tonight, mainly because I don't have much more time in the program. I'm going to have to finish soon. Can't believe it's another really long program. I'm, I'm sorry, guys, but it's one of those issues needs to be gone through in large detail. There's a lot of clips to be played. What else is that own? And that last part was d disgusting. Hey, you know, we need Mr. Falls' teacher, person who brings another Christ, we need you to pr prepare a video for our people. We need that. Does anybody not see a problem with that? We need, I'm going to encourage you to produce materials that blast you in Christ. But, but how are we going to know what they believe? The Hadith is already out. The Quran is already out. And you can talk to former Muslims who are now Christians. There are ways of doing it without blaspheming Christ and bringing his name and encouraging false prophets, enemies of Christ, to wage their war, spiritually and otherwise, against the cross. Are we starting to see a bit of an inconsistency with Phil Johnson here? Why might that be? Let's continue. We'll try and play as much of this. I'm probably going to have to come back to this again Monday. And I, although I have disagreed with those brethren, 
they just to be clear this is back to the chris aronson program in case there's any confusion this is the iron sharpens iron radio program chris aronson is host interviewing phil johnson this is recently this is june 19th 2017 we'll try and comment as fast as possible on some more of this he uh nonetheless uh continued to have that view uh, and I never held it against them. I never vilified them. And nor did they ever call me a traitor or a... Well, I'll, that's wrong. If anybody calls you a traitor, that's wrong. I mean, it's okay to rebuke you. Um, I think we, uh, we should be careful with some of the language. I completely agree. But let's realize that people are angry. And we also realize that people are angry because people are defending the indefensible. I'm not defending the behavior of people who use unwise terminology. It's unfortunate when it happens, but let's get beyond the messengers, shall we? And actually talk about the major issue. Then when that gets resolved, maybe we can go to individuals after this has all been resolved and go to them and say, you know, brother, you said this, I, I, this is, that was wrong or something like that. Or whatever the case. But rather, they're dealing with any of the imperfections in the messengers. I'm sure you'll find plenty in mine. Plenty of imperfections in me. Rather than looking at the fact that James White inv invited an imam before the saints. It doesn't matter. It even it was before the saints. Promoted him, telling him to produce materials to teach his... False Christ and Nine Gospel. Hmm. Okay, we're gonna have to skip ahead here because um trying to see where to go. So I'm gonna skip ahead. He talks about they don't really give examples. Again, you know, it's, Phil Johnson says in another part, I can't remember exactly why, or where, sorry, that you know the, the Muslims are not our enemies and things like this. Anybody outside of, the, outside of Christ is an enemy of the gospel. But the, go the Bible says to love our enemies. So we make sure we get our terminology right. We have to love our enemies. But realize that we're not supposed to join with them to further the gospel in, in spiritual enterprises. Okay? So I'm going to skip ahead to 28 minutes and then we're going to wrap it up around there. I'm going to try and get to the first break if possible. And again, for apologies, this has been another extremely long show. Normally these programs for the, for anybody who started listening to my program, never listened to me before, realize that this is not normal. I usually have my show finished about an hour, just so you're aware. Sorry, there's a problem here. Okay. Live. Giving the uh, gospel in a mosque, I, I don't know of anyone else who's been able to go into a mosque and proclaim the gospel. Uh, so you got to give him credit for that. And but should we give him credit as well for allowing Yasser Qadi to preach the gospel? According to Islam, in the ch in before the saints in in a church, church building, whatever before the saints. See, okay, James White preached the gospel, but so did Yasser Qadi. Does the ends justify the means? Are we going to get that Machiavellian? And and to make him out to be some kind of wretched apostate and, and grave danger to the body of Christ is, is exactly the kind of sort of overreactive... Why? Why is it right? Why is it okay to lambast Michael Brown? Okay, I know there's a big difference between Michael Brown and James White. But why is it okay to invoke Second John 7-11 to with Michael Brown, but it's not okay to invoke that verse when James White errors in this area? Is it possible we got too much of a lofty view of James White? Is it possible? Listen to this. This is from a couple of years ago. This is Bill Johnson commenting on James White on the Bible thumping wing nut podcast. Anyway, 
Yeah, that's the name of the program. Okay. James White. I love James White. I we don't we don't always agree on everything. This is back in like 2006, 16. Sorry, in case you're wondering. And he's spoken at conferences. Uh, the James White is arranged and things like that. But just this is important to see where he's coming from. I think, but we've never publicly disagreed. I at least I don't. I don't. That would be a battle of the titans if you and him got in a beef. That would be no. It wouldn't he clean? He clean my clock. <laughs> he's he's a, he's he's an experienced debater, yes, and I'm just is. I'm just a hack. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, there are things that we don't quite see eye to eye on. He's a he's a higher. His Calvinism is a higher brand of Calvinism than mine. Um, and uh, uh, what else? I can't think of much else, but uh, I, I've always had a great deal of respect and love for James. He's a he's a serious uh, critic of everything that he deals with. He's not just a, one of these, you know, self-appointed discernment experts like I am, you know, mm -hmm. who, who criticizes everybody. Mm -hmm. But I know he's joking here, but you know, this is kind of because he's getting all serious and saying all those discernment ministries out there who are constantly criticizing everybody. Bill, you could just about stick this. You're going to have to stick that, take that log out of your own eye first. It's going to sound like, and it has to sound like to people, grievous hypocrisy here. Inconsistent, in inconsistency. Okay. Because you're able to lambast certain people for things that are not nearly as serious as this. It depends on how severe the issue is. You know, if we just say there's a godly minister and he's serving Christ for decades and decades and decades, everybody loves him, everything's he's fantastic, and there's publicly there's nothing to rebuke him about. But then just say again using the adultery. Example, what if he's caught in adultery? Well, then his ministry's over straight away. I'm not accusing anybody of this, well, this is kind of a spiritual adultery kind of going on with Islam. But then I digress. But I mean, what do you do there? Do you just kind of go, you know what? They served for 30 years and just over one mistake for one night. Would, would you really argue like that? I've seen denominations split in two over such issues. Personality cults. What else can it be called? And it's, it's not just James White. There's like things around John Piper and other people like that. Even bringing up John Piper, he was quite happy to tear into John Piper for recommending Rick Warren, if I'm not mistaken. You see, why is everybody else for a game but not James White? What else does he say about him? This is again last year. Uh, he he's careful in what he says. He's he's a real scholar, and uh, he, he's um, uh, my first exposure to him was long time ago, back in the boy, it had to be back in the mid '80s, I think. And I I came across some tapes tapes of debates he'd done with Jerry Mattatix and some other Catholic. Yep, I yep, can't even remember who they were. Yep. Mm -hmm. Uh, at a time when I was I was trying to come to grips with what, what's the best critique of Roman Catholicism and and uh, how how do we you know how do we answer the Catholic error in the most succinct and persuasive way? And somebody gave me these, or somehow I got a hold of these debates that James had done, and I had never heard anybody as careful and articulate as he was. And, and I listened to Jerry Mattatix and I thought, I'm not sure I would have been able to really handle myself because Jerry Mattatix, whatever else you say about him, he's a... So anyway, you get the, you get the, you get the, you get the gist really there. You know, he's James White. He thinks very highly of James White and he has, I think for a very, very long time. I'll be honest. I didn't even know that right up until I'd seen that video. I was aware of that video a long time ago. Okay. Let's get back. Let's try and wrap it up um, right up until the break point discernment is usually called discernment but it's not very discerning it's undiscerning uh, undiscernment that, that we don't need that in the church we just we don't need that in the church what criticism of james white has james white been lifted to lo such a lofty position that he truly is an untouchable 
to certain people that he can bring an imam into a church and quite clearly violate, according to Phil Johnson's understanding and any other reform commentary that I came to f- care to look up, I've never been able to find anything that agrees with James White's understanding. I mean, you pro- you know, you're probably going to have to look at liberals in order to find these kind of situational hermeneutic to exclude it from today. Are we going to start saying, well... Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life back in the first century, but now he's not. Now there's many ways. Do you not see how dangerous this kind of hermeneutic is? It's astonishing. I never thought the day would ever come when I'd have to do a show like this about Phil Johnson. Seriously, I feel like I'm in a twilight zone. Is this really, really happening? But here's the thing, brothers and brothers and sisters. All of us can fall into grievous error. Pray for these brethren. Pray for James White. Pray for this whole situation that I don't have to talk about it anymore. Sick to death of talking about it. But more and more comes out, like the Linda Sarsour thing that we played at the start of the show. But what's the Christian response? In some of the people I would have had a huge amount of respect for, a lot of that's been, a lot of that's gone now. But what's the response? James knows what he's doing. Do you think for a second that Phil Johnson would say the same thing if Michael Brown did this? Or if John Piper did this? Do you think that? Really? Okay. I don't need that. There are enough... Um... There are enough wackos on the fringes of Christianity without, without leading voices in the church trying to manufacture more wackos. Is Michael Brown a wacko? Michael Brown's a very close friend of James White and has also been defending James White. Is Hmm. I thought he was a very careful scholar. And <sighs> Where is this all coming from, Phil? Where? You're going... No, Phil, can I just give you... If, you... if you actually happen to listen to this, you're going to destroy your reputation if you continue down this route. I think you will. You might say the same thing about me. I... I'm a nobody. I could disappear tomorrow. It's not going to make a major difference. It's much more serious with you because you're an elder in a church. And the Word of God uh, lists slander amongst some very heinous activity, like in Mark chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, for from within... Yeah. Okay, there's, a lot, there's no examples given in the slander, but we're going to skip ahead. One more point, he talks about fundamentalism and just kind of make some points about that. That's, that's the danger here. Yeah, and we have to go to a break right now. If anybody would like to join us on the air, we already have uh, several people waiting to have their questions asked and answered. Our email address is chrisarnzen at gmail.com. The material that's been published in this particular controversy r- really breaches the Ninth Commandment. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's interesting that H-R-I-S-A-R. Sorry there, I'm trying to find this spot now. R-N-Z-E-N at gmail.com. Please give us your first name, your city and state, and your country of residence if you live outside the USA. Don't go away. We'll be right back with Phil Johnson after these messages. Okay, I seem to have mislabeled this. I'm going to try to find it, and if not, you know, it doesn't really matter. Just make the point. Sorry, this application is not working. Okay, he makes the point, I'll just, I don't really need to play it anyway. He makes the point that it reminds him of fundamentalism. This is before the break, if I'm not mistaken. And we're going to follow this back up on Monday, Lord willing. And it'll probably be audio only, maybe video if possible, but probably not. It would be great if I could do video for every single show, but just time will not allow it. We get a TV version of this. will probably be up early next week. I'll try and have it up as quickly as possible because this is such an important issue. Um, he talks about fundamentalism and how people are tearing at each other and all that. And there's, 
there's a valid criticism to that, people nitpicking and stuff like that. True. But there was also in fundamentalism cults of personality around people like Jack Hiles. Yes, Jack Hiles would tear into John MacArthur. I remember that back in the 1990s and all sorts of stuff. Um, but there was also cults of personality. People would protect people within fundamentalism. And there was undoubtedly cults of personality within the fundamentalist movement. Jack Hiles had a huge cult of personality. Still does as a statue of the, this man outside of Hiles Anderson College still. I think it's outside of Hiles Anderson College. And this man lived a double life. He, he was a complete fraud. He had a mistress right around the corner from him. Still to this day, people defend him. I think he's great. He still have books in his shell, on their shelves. So we can invoke, oh, look at the fundamentals from the tear each other apart. Yeah, but they also defend and circle the wagon around their own and ignore all the evidence and they exalt mere men and they ignore normal levels of scrutiny. Does that sound familiar at all? We, Phil, like if you're going to criticize Michael Brown for not calling out those in his own, how is it going to sound when you won't call out somebody in your own movement? Another Reformed Baptist. Is that not going to weaken your testimony to the Charismatics? The Charismatic movement. Look, and all the way along here, I've been in complete support, almost complete unanimous support of what Phil Johnson has preached, I used to listen, I probably listen, would listen to maybe one or two, probably one on average, one sermon a, a, a month of Phil Johnson. I remember telling people I actually prefer Phil Johnson's preaching to John MacArthur's preaching. Just, I liked, I remember that baby in the bathwater sermon at um, the Strange Fire Conference. I've never had an issue. And this pops up and I'm like, whoa, where did this come out of? And I would be much closer theologically to Phil Johnson than I am to Brandon House. But this? Where is this coming out of? <sighs> Brethren, just keep keep the show in your prayers. Better wrap it up there. Megiddofilms at gmail.com. Talk to you again Monday.